So the big idea that I want to talk to you about today is actually a small idea that can have a very big impact. And that is that if you engage coffee, if you engage the product, you will discover, you will be delighted, and you will change people's lives. In 1497, Amerigo Vespucci, an Italian explorer, discovered America. And then a man named Martin Van Vald Simuller sketched a map and labeled it America. Later, he decided he had some second thoughts, and it was too late. They actually printed 1,000 of these maps, distributed them. So there we have it, America. And then they discovered another person named Christopher Columbus actually discovered America in 1492 five years prior to Amerigo. So who discovered America? And, and why is this important? This is interesting information. And we are a people that are obsessed with information. Technology has made it possible that we can access it to no end. And when we process this information, it's easy to disconnect with core products and people. Because we process this information within our context. And, and a little bit more, as you know, when you're passionate about something, you discover that there's more to it. And labels are something that I think are very difficult for us to break away from. And the reason I talk about this is a story about discovery, it's a story about information, and it's about labels. Uh, in some cases, you have bad information, like Martin did. I kind of wonder if Martin thought about naming this map Martin. What if he had gone with his last name, which I had to write down, Walzi Müller? He's from Deutschland. We could have been Walzi Müllerland, but we're not. We live in America. Um, so why are labels so important? Labels are something on the outside that give us an indication of what's on the inside. And the reason I wanted to start by talking about a label is because that is the best chance we have to understand coffee sometimes. Um, there are up to 32 links in the coffee chain. And, and as consumers here, we connect with the last two. In fact, it's just one that is split into two. And that is what I call the immediate consumable. You lay down some money, and you get a cup of coffee. So that's something that's instant. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And the other one is, you're buying a product that you need to take home and do some work. You need to take that product, you need to make the coffee yourself, basically. And how do you decide what coffee to buy? This is a very difficult thing for a lot of people, especially if you're really interested in coffee and you end up torn about it. Um, and if you think about wine, and, and I'm a little bit done with wine and coffee analogies, but I think there are some good ones. Um, when, you, when you see a bottle of wine, how do you decide what wine you're going to buy? And keep in mind there's a very big difference between wine and coffee, where wine is a finished product. There's nothing you need to do when you take that bottle home. There's nothing a sommelier needs to do to add value to the product, to the intrinsic value of that product that's inside. They can give you fantastic information. They can help you engage. But you need to experience the product yourself. So when you look at a label, you walk into a grocery store, you're assaulted with information. How, how do you decide? So I would like to encourage you to blow past the label and just dig in, get your hands dirty, and connect with the product. Engage, discover, be delighted. So the other choice is you're going to put money down, you're going to get a cup of coffee. This is a very difficult one for me because uh, whenever you're passionate about something, you find that it's difficult to talk about those things in terms that are meaningful to most people because you are so entrenched in it. And in January of 2010, I did a survey in Bellingham, Washington, and I asked, where do you like to go for coffee and why? And then I asked for more reasons. You know, tell me why. Why do you like to go to your favorite place for coffee? And, and I asked a lot of people, and I gathered all this information. I put it into categories, and I labeled it. And what I discovered was that people don't go to coffee houses for coffee. People don't go to coffee houses for coffee. Coffee was not in the top five reasons why people go to coffee houses. <laughs> so why do we go to coffee houses? Uh, well, the answer won't surprise you. Um, coffee was actually number six. Price, interestingly enough, was number seven. That wasn't in the top five either. 
So we like to go to coffee houses because of the comfortable couch, because of the fireplace, because of the Wi-Fi, because of the convenience, because of the selection. Maybe they have really delicious paninis or fresh made soups. Uh, we go to coffee houses for many, many reasons. We go for the experience. Sometimes we go to be seen. Sometimes we go to get away. Um, so with all of these different values, good values, how, does a pro how do you engage a product when there's so many competing values that are trumping it? How does one that loves coffee open a coffee house when everyone that comes there is coming for a different reason? So what I did is I started sharing this with some roasters around the world, and I found out that they shared some similar frustrations, and they could identify. And they would start to tell me, I said, Edwin, you know, I think that uh, if I could open up my dream coffee house, what I would do is I'd have this excellent equipment in the back that we have in our training room and some amazingly delicious coffee and nothing more. I said, why don't you do it? Well, it would never work. And I kept hearing that from lots of different roasters. The same thing, without them talking to each other. They, they got excited when they heard the results of my survey, and they, and they thought, it would be so great to do this, but none of them did it. So I did. Um, <laughs> and in January last year of 2011, I opened up uh, what, is, as far as I know, is the only coffee house in North America that does not have any cream or sugar. So my goal was I wanted to open a coffee bar that did not have any of the things that people look for when they go to a coffee house, except for coffee. What do you think happened? It didn't go so well. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I did is I, I had a plan. It's really a calculated experiment. And it's still open today, by the way. If you ever come through Bellingham, you can check it out. Uh, one person runs it, and we have nothing but coffee. The seating is not comfortable. There's no Wi-Fi. It's hard to find. There's no sign. There's no sugar. There's no cream. It's fantastic. So if, <laughs> so if you love coffee, if you really want to engage, you are just in seventh heaven. But if you aren't there for the coffee, this is the most disappointing coffee house in America. And I love it. <laughs> and my philosophy is often to pursue something that you love and put it out there. But does that mean that it's going to be a good business? And that's something I think that we often find ourselves in, and that's what we find in the coffee industry. And that's why my small challenge to you is to engage and discover, be delighted, and change people's lives. And so I've shared a little bit about the first two. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how you can change people's lives. And, and the way I'll do that is by sharing a little bit about basically the big picture of coffee. Coffee in North America, coffee... Uh, in producing countries, and then a little bit about sustainability. So the birthplace of coffee is Ethiopia, and we started consuming coffee here in, uh, in the 1600s, and then Boston Tea Party was a pivotal, pivotal event. We dumped all the tea out of these boats, and in, in essence, it was a declaration of independence, and we switched to coffee. America became a coffee-drinking nation. And why, why coffee? Well, it was the only other beverage that, that was a social beverage that was not alcohol. And then later on, I'm going to fast forward quite a bit here to uh, the Great Depression. Something interesting happened there. Spending went down on everything, except for alcohol. It did not go up. It did not go down. But coffee, it went up. Coffee, it, as it turns out, is, is very recession-proof. Uh, it's an affordable luxury. And in the United States, over 300 million people, there's over 80% of us that are drinking coffee. Over 50% drinking coffee every single day, and about 30% that are drinking coffee, not every day, but regularly. That's a lot of people drinking coffee. Coffee has been commoditized. Coffee is a fruit. Have you ever seen anything like this before? This is what coffee looks like. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Uh, but most people don't think of coffee as a fruit that you would pick from a tree that gets ripe at some point, and that it makes any difference that you pick it whether or not it's ripe. And what happens from there? How does it get to your cup? So coffee has been commoditized. In Guatemala, well, there's over 50 countries that produce coffee. In Guatemala, where I grew up, there are over 90,000 producers. And my family is one of them. Latins have big families. My grandfather is one out of 18. 
So you can do some math. That's a lot more people now working in coffee. We have about six people that are working with us full time, year round. And then we have up to 200, 250 people that work seasonally picking coffee. It's incredibly labor intensive. Coffee is something that is an agricultural product that has an incredible impact in our world, environmentally, socially, and economically. So what I want to tell you a little bit about is basically three different points regarding sustainability. Uh, this here is a coffee plant. And this takes about six, six months to get to this point here. Um, maybe even up to a year. Um, and so I'm putting these two next to each other. You have a coffee plant and a bag of coffee. Um, the, the path to get from one to the next is extraordinary. I mentioned 32 links. It can be more, it can be less. Um, but it's, it's extraordinary how many links are in the value chain. And it's amazing how well the quality, wherever that quality may be, whether it's very high or very low, how, how well it's preserved all the way up until it gets to the consumer. And then this commodity gets leveled out. And it's very difficult to find and discover these precious gems, to discover a fruit that is sweet, that is citrusy, that is pleasant, that's refreshing, that's delicious. When I think of coffee, when everything is done right, it's so delicious. Maybe a hot brewed coffee poured over some ice, that should be a refreshing fruit juice. And why fruit juice? Because it is a fruit, and it's juice. <laughs> so from a sustainability perspective, there are three things that uh, are commonly talked about, and a lot of consumers are asking about this, and obviously this, this causes for, for roasters to do their homework, uh, whether they're very interested in it or not. Um, and, and I find that there are people that are very passionate and people that are very business savvy, and I, try and partner with people that have a balance of the two um, to be able to take something that's an excellent product and carry it forward all the way to the consumer. Um, so environmentally, there are a lot of certifications out there. And environmentally, it is very difficult. In fact, it is impossible to produce a delicious tasting coffee year after year after year from a certain piece of land without taking care of it today. If you're pushing yield, the quality will go down. If you're pushing yield, you're probably negatively impacting the environment. Socially, coffee is very labor intensive. This is actually a 14 ounce bag. This is how much coffee you need to pick. It will take you 15 to 20 minutes to end up with this. And you're not picking it somewhere flat. You're picking it on a cliff where you can barely stand without anything, but then you need to carry it out almost 100 pounds on your back at a time. Um, it's very hard work. It's incredibly hard work. And most of the nicer coffees tend to be in places that are very steep, very difficult to walk around even when you aren't carrying anything. So socially, in order to get a delicious tasting cup of coffee, you need to pick the coffee when it's ripe. In order to do that, you need to pay people fairly to be able to pick only the right fruit because you can't just strip all of it off. You want only the right fruit, which means you need to go back. And you need to go back again later. And you've got three, four, five, sometimes six waves where you go back and repick the same trees from the same harvest. Most places have a harvest once a year. Some places have it twice. So the last one is probably the one I'm most passionate about because I think it's most encompassing and it's most practical and logical to people up and down the chain, and that's the economic variable economic sustainability. And to me, it's simply a matter of efficient relationships where someone is buying exactly what someone else wants. And when it's an exceptional quality product, it's a beautiful thing to see. It's a beautiful thing to see. This coffee here comes from a farm in Northwest Guatemala called Las Aguas Altas. This farm actually didn't have a name so the roaster here in Grand Rapids, when they asked me, what's the farm's name? We want to put it on the bag. I said, I don't know. Let me ask him. And he said, I don't know. I was born here, but we never named it. <laughs> so I called him back, and I said, well, it has no name. And he told me that if you want, you pick a name. So this roaster from a company here in Grand Rapids named the farm Las Aguas Altas. And they were serving that coffee here in the last break. I got a chance in January of this year to take this coffee to this family 
and let them brew coffee the way they brew coffee, their coffee, from their farm, for them to drink their own coffee for the first time. And this is a family that was born on this land. All they know is coffee. This is one kilometer away from our farm. We just got electricity seven years ago. Coffee travels a long way. And I guess in closing, if I can communicate one thing to you, the pursuit of experiencing quality is worth it. You will discover. You may discover some delicious coffees. You may discover some really unpleasant coffees. Um, but it's worth the pursuit to discover. And you will be delighted when you find those delicious coffees. And it will change people's lives. Because this family, the Mendes family, they don't want charity. Just like any other hardworking producer. When you look at all the certifications that are out there, they want to work hard, they want to produce something excellent, and they want someone to love it. A fair price for a great product. Over the last 24 hours, I've had probably at least a couple dozen people ask me something. So I decided I was going to tweak how I was going to finish my talk. Um, people said, what is cupping? What is cupping? And cupping is, and I thought I would include it because it's relevant and it's a way that you can engage coffee. Uh, cupping is how professionals evaluate the flavor of coffee and they evaluate the quality. And essentially what it is, is you take, uh, you take the coffee and you go through a process where you have some ground coffee and you pour water over it and you then smell the fragrance. Sorry, you smell the fragrance before you pour the water. That's the dry ground and then you smell the aroma. And then you take a spoon and you break this crust and it settles down and you taste the coffee. And there's a certain way that you taste this coffee and it's a slurp. And you do that so that you can coat your tongue evenly. And you're essentially taking a liquid, turning it, turning it into a mist and exploding it over your tongue. It's like fuel injection. You want, this, you want this fuel to be explosive. And the reason is your tongue has taste buds all over it and they're all different. You have sweet, savory, your, your tongue is different, and all of our tongues are different. And so if there are certain flavors that are more intense, um, you may not taste anything else if you taste that flavor first. And so you want to taste it all at once. So in closing, I'll give you an example of how you can engage coffee if you're bored at home. And I recommend buy a couple coffees at a time. But if you have two, you can compare. your tongue. Thank you.